the business can create a life of its own and become something that you don't even recognize and you kind of feel like it's taking you along for the ride and it's not yours anymore. And th that's what I try to help people think through. Next up, representing Primal Life Organics, Josh Making Bank Felber. Welcome to Making Bank. I am Josh Felber, where we uncover the mindset and the success strategies of the top 1% so you can amplify your life and your business today. Super excited for today's guest. David grew up with a tribe of Mayan Indians in a remote village in the highlands of Guatemala. He's an author, a speaker, and an advisor to entrepreneurial experts and he was referred in the New York Times as the expert's expert. Dan Pink said in his fifth book, The Business of Expertise, that this book is essential reading material for entrepreneurs in any field. And recently, his newest book, The Secret Trade Craft of $1 Million Advisors, is meant as a handbook for the top 1% of consultants. It shares the secrets for building an advisory practice beyond compare. He has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, USA Today, and Forbes. And he is a regular keynote speaker at the international conferences and co-host of the Marketing Field's most listened to podcast, Two Bobs. I'm excited and want to welcome David Baker to Making Bank today. Thank you. Really good to be here, Josh. I've been looking forward to this. I hope you're not going to try and stump me with some tough questions. <laughs> I don't know if they're tough, but we like to free flow and just really dive into areas uh, and just kind of extract those nuggets I think people can apply, and whether it's in their personal life or their business. So I, probably the glaring question for anybody in the audience that doesn't know you is just, how did you get living with a tribe of Mayan Indians? Well, it was actually my parents' fault. They were, they were medical missionaries. And so when I was born in the U.S., but I didn't really live here much until I was 18. So when I was young, they moved to Latin America first for a year in Costa Rica to learn Spanish. And then we went to this tribe of Mayan Indians. And dad did. Dad was a dentist. Mom was a nurse. And they did literacy work as um, evangelical missionaries up in this tribe. So I grew up there. We didn't have running water, didn't have electricity, no roads or stores. And it was a very, I mean, looking back on it, it was a very strange upbringing. But at the time, it just felt very normal. I didn't know anything about the U.S. I embarrassed myself regularly when I came back here and didn't know anything. I didn't know who Elvis was. Everybody was, I remember the day he died and I'm thinking, and everybody's up late at night watching movies of Elvis, and I'm thinking, man, this guy sucks as an actor. What's the big deal? <laughs> I had never heard of him, you know, just on and on and on. But it was a it was a wonderful upbringing. I'm very grateful for that time. What were like? Uh, just curious. I mean, what were some of like maybe like your three biggest takeaways that you really pulled from while you know growing up down there? Oh, uh, well, I think sort of being flexible. So. All kinds of things can happen, and it, it, you can prepare as much as possible, but you're, there are still going to be things that are out of your control, like really nasty weather, or maybe it's lack of food over a certain period of time, or disease. So just really preparing for that. I think s sort of self-reliance as well. Uh, it turned me a, into a little bit of an introvert. Uh, what am I? Who am I kidding? I'm I'm a big <laughs> introvert. I'm kind of over people in general. I'm so relieved that I don't have to like really be with you. I can just see you on the screen here. Sure. Those, kind of, <laughs> those kinds of things were really indelible. The need to read a lot, to learn, to just accept that you don't have to go to a traditional school for many, many years to succeed in, in society. All of these expectations that we have about how normal life has to happen, they just don't they just don't apply to how I think. I, I, I'm willing to just reconsider things completely and maybe come back to the same uh, conclusions that everybody else has, but then also in some cases say, no, that's not really the way it has to be. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's important. I mean, especially as entrepreneurs, I mean, we got to look at it that way is, you know, and that's, I think, what makes you different 
than anybody else is looking at something like, oh, wait, I mean, that, it doesn't have to be that way. And you go create a business from that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I, a lot of us have these expectations that we have to follow these sort of rules to achieve success. And part of that is fed by the fact that there are all these experts, in some cases, me included, who are telling people, you do these seven things in this order and you'll have this success. But constantly there are a small minority of people that are breaking those rules and figuring out a different path to the same sort of success. So I tend to question a lot of things. And it, in some cases, it wastes a little bit of time because I should just not be so questioning. But in other times, it's, it just gets me thinking in different directions, too. It's been interesting to see. We have two boys. My wife and I have two boys. And, and they're sort of the same in an annoying way, honestly, because they're just <laughs> always questioning everything. And uh, that's true. I mean, we have three kids, and I mean, we've taught them all to be curious. And so they ask tons of questions. And um, it was funny. We were flying back one time from uh, Florida, and uh, they're twin. My boys are twins, and they're identical. And they were sitting next to, in the middle seat next to somebody. It was, he asked them all this, all these same questions. What went up to get to the bathroom? They changed seats. The other one <laughs> sat down, just to come sit next to me and stuff. And then the other one sat next to my wife, and asked them like the almost identical. The dude's kind of like, wait a minute. I know I just answered all these for you, and we're like, hey, you know, they're, it's a different one here next to you. <laughs> so, with them, yeah. Creating that curiosity. So like you said, it can be a good thing, but then it's also some people may come across annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, awesome. Well, um, tell, us, tell me a little bit then. You know, you, you got back when you were 18 in the United States. Kind of what was that journey for you, you know, getting, you know, becoming an expert consultant and now, you know, an advisor and everything? Sure. Well, I went to grad school. I spent five years full time in grad school. And my goal in doing that was to teach. When I emerged from grad school, I wanted to teach anthropology and language. So that was the entire focus. Sure. And um, I, you know, about halfway through, I discovered that it that field wasn't for me, but I, I was far enough along. I decided I'd go ahead and finish my graduate degree. We started a marketing firm in the little town we lived in, in Indiana, Warsaw, Indiana, because I looked around and felt like, wow, there's such a gap here. It's um, what people are doing in terms of, of communicating their own businesses and developing those marketing messages. It just sucked. It just wasn't very good. And I thought, how hard could this be? Turned out to be a little bit harder than I thought <laughs> in retrospect, but did that for five or six years. And through a very strange set of circumstances, and I feel like that's kind of the message here, is that you have to look for those really small opportunities mm. and jump on them. And most of them will not lead somewhere, but you have to be open to the fact that one or two of them will, right? Sure. Anyway, I was talking to this guy, subscribed to his publication, which was full of business advice for firms like mine. And I said, why don't you... Um, advi offer advisory services and not just this newsletter publication. And he said, I don't want to do that. And he gave me his reasons for it. And he said, but why don't you do that? So in other words, he was suggesting that I advise my peers. And he said, before I could even respond, why don't I put an ad in the publication? You just pay me 10% of what you make and we'll just see what happens. I didn't think anything would come of it. Right. But firms started to call and ask. It wasn't that I was running this amazing firm. It was a very typical average firm, but people started to call and ask for my help to advise them from peer to peer. And pretty quickly that took over my life. So within a few months I was doing that, that launched the business that I'm running now, have been doing it for 25 years or so. And it's to be an advisor to entrepreneurial experts who are trying to build their firm. So it's to help them think through positioning, staffing, and all of that. And I love, so I stumbled into, first of all, a very tight positioning. So very few people are candidates for what I need. Okay. Everybody else is bored with what I do. And that's the way it should be, right? So right. I landed on the right positioning. And then I figured out that I needed to be a deep student of this and 
create tons of marketing to give Google something to work with so that I had a constant stream of opportunity coming to me so that I could be really choosy about that. And that was how the beginning of it worked. I, some of it was smart. Some of it was just dumb luck. And it's developed into this very – I'm just very grateful for the business I have. No, that's awesome. You know, over the years then, I mean, obviously you have some time into it. What are some of the kind of the biggest things that you've pulled from working with, um, you know, these different companies and, you know, I guess maybe what are kind of the top three pain points that are pretty similar that you find along the way? Yeah. And I don't know if this is true in all the other service businesses or the expertise businesses, but one of the big things is that people are accidental entrepreneurs in the sense that they really know how to do something specific, something technical. They have some deep knowledge. What they don't bring to the table is an ability to make smart business decisions about how to wrap that into something that makes money, that makes that that follows the right benchmarks, that knows how to market itself. So they're all really good at doing something. They're not as good at wrapping that into a business that's really successful. That's that that's sort of what gives me a lot of business, right? Another one is 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 misunderstanding the role of growth for them. So they are allergic to saying no to opportunity that comes to them. So they are constantly trying to find ways to take this opportunity that keeps coming in and turning it into something amazing. And because of that, they tend to grow too quickly and they wake up one day discovering that they are running a business or they should be running a business that they don't really want to run. They want to do the work. They don't want to manage people. And growth is about deciding whether you're comfortable in letting your role migrate from doing the work to being a mentor and a coach to people. And if you can make that that transition successfully, then growth makes a lot of sense to you. Then probably the third one is just how bad people are at being really disciplined at consistently sending out the right message so that they always have more opportunity than they can accept because otherwise they're going to turn bad clients. They're going to try to turn bad clients into good ones and it won't work. And they'll just wake up one day sort of hating their life and, and not loving their business itself. The, the business can create a life of its own and become something that you don't even recognize and you kind of feel like it's taking you along for the ride and it's not yours anymore. And th that's what I try to help people think through. The last thing too, I mean, you mentioned, which was kind of what you did as well with the Google and the marketing and everything is putting that message out there so that you do continuously have a stream. Just kind of going down that path for a second, what were some of those things that you found that worked really well from that messaging standpoint or content standpoint? Right. Well, and the, the truth is that, that the answer to that has changed, right? In the early days, sure. what really worked was direct mail for me. That was 25 years ago. Obviously, that's not something I do anymore. When Google came along in the late 90s, that changed the equation completely because I and everybody else no longer had a protected marketplace that was mm. bounded by geography. Right. Now – I could go out and find clients further away from me, but my competitors could do work for my clients who were within my geographic bubble. So everything changed. And then people's expectations around using Google changed as well. So I can be sitting here watching TV at night and think of some question I have. And my expectation is that I can go to a search engine and within seconds, I can find the exact answer and it will probably be free, right? Right. So all of that combines to this notion of, of, of disseminating really useful insight to people so that they get to taste or experience what it's like to work with you. And, and you're okay giving all of that away in the hopes that a few people will be willing to pay you good money to apply that to their specific situation. So my marketing is it's exclusively exclusively around giving away useful insight um, so that when somebody, whether it's a month from now or 10 years from now, somebody will come to me and pay me a lot of money to help them if they think I can be helpful to them.
Gotcha. Okay. No, that makes sense. And then with that, um, so we kind of asked kind of what were the top three pain points? What were some of the, I guess, the top three wins or big significant shifts that you were able to work with them or create an impact in the, in these different companies? One of those was doing a lot more paying attention to look for some of the patterns that my clients were facing. So pattern matching and then turning that into um, intellectual property where I could package that up and further differentiate myself from the other competitors out there. So they could do a lot of the same things that I could do, but they didn't necessarily have this particular black box that could answer something more efficiently and effectively. So that was one. And over the last, I don't know, 20 some years. So the last, you know, not the first five, but, but after that, developed about four of those. And that's been really, really helpful as a point of differentiation. Another, I think, is uh, this is odd because I've been featured in all these places, but the truth is I've never looked for that once. It's all been accidental. And so my theory is that I have to be committed to playing the the late night smoky bars and giving those people my best. And every once in a while in the crowd will be somebody that wants to do something for me. They want to write an article or they want to invite me to speak or something like that. And, and then using those appearances to build on them and to build it into something better. So I think it's those two things. And in, in, I, I'm like, I do my own podcast and, and you have way more positive reviews of your podcast than I do. So I should really be asking you this question. Like, what is it, <laughs> what is it that you do that has created such a positive vibe that sort of builds on itself? And now you're so well known out there within a group of people. Uh, maybe that's another podcast, but, you know, you've obviously <laughs> figured something out here. <laughs> Right. No, I didn't know what you're saying. I mean, and it's, you know, I think, you know, a lot of it falls back on, you know, how you're interviewing the guests, you know, and, and creating that real realness about it. Um, then more, I think static, same questions for every episode probably. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, no, that's, that's, uh, it makes, it makes total sense. So one, one thing too, that I thought was super cool. Uh, was the whole fact that you, you're a helicopter and airplane pilot. You teach high performance motorcycle racing. So, how, like, how do you have time for that? How did you even head down that path? I, I think it's super cool. Yeah, it's sort of amazing. I'm still alive. I <laughs> take so many risks. There's probably some people that wish I wasn't. Well, it's um, f for me. I, so it's a fundamental belief about how a business should act. So, I. I think I should have I, I should have a very interesting personal life. It should be sh so interesting that I start to get upset when my business life starts to crowd it out. So mm -hmm. that puts pressure on my business life to be done efficiently within a certain number of hours a day so that I have time to do these other things. And it should also put pressure on my business life to throw off enough money so that I can afford to do some of the things that I enjoy, right? Right. But what drives me to do those specific things is that they're all consuming. I can't be thinking about a client when I'm going 180 miles an hour with my knee on the ground, right? right. <laughs> I simply can't. So it's, I only choose hobbies that are so self, con so all consuming that, that they crowd out all of business because I want, I want to do amazing work for a few hours a day, whatever that ends up being. And then I want to leave it completely. And I view my life choices as I chose this path. Not really. It kind of was chosen for me and I just took advantage of it. But I feel like I probably could have been successful enough at 10 or 15 things. So if this fails, it's not that big a deal. Sure. I, I'll just do something else. And that gives me the freedom to experiment mm. and, and not be afraid of failure. And, and I've, I've experienced failure um, with a business where I made some really bad financial choices many, many years, 30 years ago. I've also been very poor. And I wasn't any unhappier 
and I'm not afraid of poverty either. It's uh, I could live with it if it happens again. I don't prefer it, but it could <laughs> it could happen. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's interesting. It, you know, and I kind of the same experience. I mean, ever since like 14, I'd kind of say when I had my first real business over the years, I never had that fear of failure or uh, going into a business thing. Oh, well, what if this fails or what if that and everything. And, you know, it's interesting to hear you kind of say that same thing and, you know, how you have applied it, whether personally or, or business wise and everything. I know we got a little bit of time left. I wanted to dive in real quick too on your Secret Tradecraft of Elite Advisors book. Kind of tell us kind of what stemmed writing that and then kind of some of the highlights from it. Sure. So that book hasn't been released yet. It'll be out in about two months. The fifth book, The Business of Expertise, is out. And when I was writing that one, I was thinking, how could I write an even shorter book that would really be interesting to a small group of people? And I, I, I decided that see, I've written about positioning, about roles, about management, but I've never written about some of the the secrets that some of the best advisors, and I don't mean the silly clickbait sort of secrets. <laughs> I'm talking about real secrets of somebody who's regularly making a million dollars a year without ripping people off, right? Mm, and without right. trying to sell something to other people where if you'll just be like me, you can, that's not my style. I, sure. I want it to be very substantive. And so that's what prompted me to start to write this book. It's, it's a nerve wracking book in the sense that when my clients read it, they may see some things in there that were that are a surprise to them about how clients need to be treated, the things you should do, the things you shouldn't do, and so on. So this is really about how do you translate the right positioning into leverage? How do you use that leverage without abusing your clients? What is the role of money? Um, how involved and uninvolved should you be in client in clients' lives? So it's really down in the weeds sort of look at, at consulting. And I want it to be a handbook that uh, advisors that by advisors, I mean, people who are selling their thinking for a living, not sure. their doing for a living. I want them to read this and say, ah, oh, now there's a dozen things I'd like to do a little bit differently after this. So I'm excited about it. It's not out yet, but it's all done and, and at the press. Awesome. Yeah. And I think right when this is dropping too, it should be coming. I think it should be landing right around the same time. So great, it'll, great. people can uh, follow the links down below and pick up where the different areas where you have the book available at. So Sure. So, yeah. And you kind of mentioned, you know, uh, when you were kind of giving an overview of what's in there, how, you know, how to treat clients, because we do have a good handful of people that watch Making Bank that, you know, have uh, consulting type businesses and they help people with coaching and everything. So I guess kind of what was one of the things that you found out, like what is the best way to manage and, you know, treat your clients? I think it's first of all, deciding whether you're more of a consultant or a coach. Mm. If you're a coach, you need to be very accessible and kind and patient. If you're, advisor, if you're an advisor, those kinds of things work against you normally. Okay. You're too accessible. You're so close to the client that it's hard for you to tell them the tough things. Um, you'll feel obligated to to get into a very regular relationship and not sure how to get out of it. So mm. I'm talking more with the folks who are more, they're, they're dropping behind enemy lines to liberate a, a population. They're not so much the occupying force that's going to be there forever and ever and ever. And so if that's the kind of approach you're taking, then you want to think about what it means to be an expert and how to develop healthy leverage with your clients so they listen to you, like payment terms. How does that relate? How how other people at the firm have access to you? Just all of those sort of down in the weeds kind of questions. Cool. Well, awesome. What's uh, one last thing you're like, oh man, I was hoping Josh was going to ask this, but he didn't, that you just kind of want to let everybody know before we wrap up here. I think, well, we're living in a really strange year, right? Um, <laughs> but if we if we just assume that we're a little bit back to normal, it feels to me like one of the 
One of the biggest impediments to our continued growth is the success that we've already reached. So we're afraid to jeopardize that. We're afraid to make changes, to explore more. We, we move, instead of being in the creation mode, we move into the maintenance mode where we protect what we've created. And I think there's this spirit that real entrepreneurs have that's not afraid to throw it all out again and recreate something new. So hopefully that creates um, some new thinking in your listeners as they contemplate what they might, like how much of what they're doing is just accepting and resting on their laurels rather than thinking about doing even bigger and better things and taking more risks as they move forward. Awesome. Guys, I hope you guys are paying great attention to this. If not, go back, rewind, listen, watch this again. Listen to what David's talking about. There's so many different amazing pieces that he's dropped throughout this episode um, through the different ways he's telling the story to being able to be fearless when you go after something and then, you know, setting your business up to, so it supports, you know, how you want to live your life and not the other way around. You're not a slave to your business. And so uh, go back, listen, watch this again. Make sure you guys are taking notes as long as you're not driving. <laughs> and, and again, David, I appreciate you coming on today and uh, sharing some insights and just uh, spending your time today with us. Thank you, Josh. I really appreciate the invitation. I am Josh Felber. You are watching Making Bank. Get out and be extraordinary. <laughs> 